Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Taste of Art program. My name is Stacey Brennan. I'm the Curator of Education for the Lehigh University Art Galleries. We are a free museum located on Lehigh University's campus in Bethlehem, PA. Um, it's my pleasure to kick off this, uh, this recording today, this event, and to have the honor of introducing our partner for the Taste of Art, Maite gomez Rejon, founder of Art Bites. Um, I'm also excited to introduce our program partner for this episode, uh, the Kellen Foundation. Uh Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Picciabono and I'm the executive chef as well as director of operations here at Kellen Foundation. We're a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to making the healthy choice the easy choice throughout the Lehigh Valley. We understand that there may be a lot of reasons why someone is not able to access fresh nutrient dense food. Some of the obstacles may include time constraints, cost, availability, as well as accessibility if they live too far from a grocery store. We plan to address all of these obstacles through our Eat Real Food mobile market, as well as our plant-forward lifestyle medicine meals that we make daily here at Kellen Kitchens. We source our produce from local farms whenever possible and are passionate about providing scrumptious food at an affordable price at convenient locations throughout the Lehigh Valley. We believe that eating healthy should be delicious, and accessible to everyone and are committed to serving our community through Kellen's Healthy Neighborhood Immersion Strategy. It includes educational activities as well as garden as a classroom programs throughout all of our local elementary schools, food access strategies through our Eat Real Food mobile market, whole food plant-based cooking classes through Kellen Kitchens, as well as intensive therapeutic lifestyle change programs through Kellen Lifestyle Medicine. If you're interested in learning more about any of these programs, feel free to visit our website at www.kellen.org, as well as emailing us directly at info And in the meantime, remember to enjoy some delicious real food. And today we're going to focus on the work of Tatiana Parcetto, who is an artist in our collection that we have quite a few works from. And she is a photo-based artist whose imagery continuously delineates themes of ritual, religion, and the intricate traditions of various cultures. She uses her body in different ways to um, evoke ideas of identity, memory, territory, and time. Um, in this series, we have here um, interior cartography. She's using her hand and mapping different places that she's lived for lived experience and ways to kind of bring together imagery in ways that um, individuals of all ages can really relate to. Um, she's really playing with ideas of historical memory as well as contemporary memory. Um, she evokes ideas of different cultures and religions, as I said before, and kind of maps those across her hands and across different body parts. Um, she uses black and white images um, of her body and then found imagery that she finds that evokes kind of those themes that and I, as well as kind of this idea of the exterior and the interior. So these are, this is a focus on her knees um, and her legs and kind of the idea of what's underneath the surface. So although we kind of have these lived experiences, they're not really on the surface and kind of how people relate across time and space. She's really poetically kind of superimposing these images, um, which we're going to do a little bit today, as well as kind of with the way that this relates to um, our recipe today and kind of the overlay of different ingredients across time, across culture, and the influence that we see um, across different, um, different regions in the United States and as well as their influence today in Mexico. Yeah, go ahead. I'll kick it over so, to you, Maite. Tell us a little bit about um, how, to, how we can connect uh, the imagery that we've been looking at to our recipe today. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. I love these images. I wasn't familiar with, with um, her work. And it's, it's so, I don't know, there's something just so romantic and so, um, so somber and elegant and kind of eerie about them. But I love what you were saying about, about this whole idea of, you know, art and identity and what we could, you know, the whole, this whole idea of mapping, you know, and what's been below the surface um, just by looking at this hand. And also just this whole idea of just hands, just the image of, of hands that they have so much information. And since when we're, and especially your hands, you know, in, in any culture, but in Mexico, you know, making masa and just the women, you know, have historically, you know, cooked in Mexico, um, you know, and, but, but 
no really cookbooks were attributed to, to women or women didn't publish cookbooks until the end of the 19th century. Even now they're historically have been the ones that have been sort of making the meals. Um, and these images, these of these 16th century codexes, right? They just tell so many, so many stories. Um, so I'm gonna kind of jump into making this recipe that the Kellen Foundation um, provided to us. And this whole idea that you mentioned that what is between the surface, like the image of the knees with the, with the cells, like what is between the surface of things? And I'm, I'm so fascinated by that, sort of what lies beneath. And when thinking about food, this whole idea of identity and like, oh, what is authentic? You know, what is, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is the right way to do things or the wrong way to do things? And there really is no right or wrong. And authentic can mean so many things depending on where you are sort of in, in history. Um, but this whole idea again of, of mapping and experiences, you could really do that. I mean, she's doing it with her art, but you could do that by looking at a dish and sort of taking all of the ingredients apart. And each ingredient tells a story and the dish, the finished dish is really a story about time and experiences and trade and politics and, and everything. And this simple um, salad that we're making, this or, or salsa, this black bean salsa, which is kind of salady that Kellen Foundation provided, really is that. It tells an entire um, story. So what I think that I'll do is just talk about each individual ingredient and we'll layer them and then mix them together. And then we'll jump into our own collages, like our own stories. That sounds great. Perfect. Okay, so, so we're making this, this salsa. So I have, um, I have a bowl here, a giant bowl. And I'm just going to start putting everything in this bowl. Um, but starting with beans. So Mishri, you think, so this ingredient has beans, corn, tomatoes, you know, peppers, onions. But the primary ingredients are ingredients that are native to Mexico, like our, you know, that the Ana said are our artists today. Um, so I'm going to start with beans. Um, so we have one, I have one can of be black beans, drained beans, most beans, um, with the exception of, say, garbanzo beans, are native to the Americas. And there are over 50 different kinds of beans native to Mexico. And they say that when eating a bowl of beans, you are eating identity. This whole idea of identity, sort of beans are native to Mexico, 50 different types of beans, many of them because of time, because of policies um, have sort of become extinct. And there's a whole group in Mexico that are trying to bring these heirloom, heirloom beans um, back. Um, so, and beans together, with corn are two of the most important ingredients in Mexico. And even, you know, in the US, when we're in elementary school, we learned about, you know, the, the companion, the three sisters and the companion sort of farming, corn, beans, and squash, which I don't have with me, um, but they all grow, to, grow together. You know, corn is the life force of the Americas and it's imbued with so many religious symbols. I mean, corn, I have one right here, it was considered a literal gift from the gods. Um, and humans, according to Mayan mythology, humans were literally molded from masa. I mean, they are just, Mexican and corn are sort of go hand in hand. Corn grows straight up, beans were planted to grow around the corn and then squash was grown at the bottom to keep the weeds down, to suppress the weeds. So it was the perfect, perfect marriage. And also beans offered, you know, provided the ground with nitrogen. So it was this sort of perfect environment that they created um, in this type of farming called milpas, you know, farming. So it's really sort of, you know, just magical. Corn and beans, particularly nixtamalized corn, which is what masa is made out of, which is basically taking the corn, um, boiling it in lime, and which is you know calcium hydroxide, not not lime, but calcium hydroxide that just makes the kernel soft and brings out all of the nutrients in corn. So nixtamalized corn, which this is just regular corn, it and beans provide the near perfect 
diet, add a little squash, you had some, some vitamins upon which civilizations thrived for centuries. So these two things are the perfect marriage. So I have one can of corn drained, rinsed. I'm just going to put it in this bowl here. And I'm going to add one cup of corn. Um, and it's amazing, like there are some early images of corn gods, Mayan corn gods, have, you know, this, this, this god with jewels and the hair of the god are basically like silks flowing in the wind. My mom used to make when I was little this tea with corn silks. Um, it's basically boiled corn silk for, that was good for, um, for, stomach, for stomach aches. Um, so I have my cup of corn that I'm gonna add to my beans. And then I'm gonna add a cup of diced tomatoes, also native to Mexico. Um, the word tomato comes from the Nahuatl, which is the Aztec language word, um, which literally translates to something round and plump. Lots of different tomatoes from tiny cherry tomatoes, big, you know, tomatoes, um, tomatillos, which are the little green ones that have this, you know, husk around them. Um, but this is, you know, they used to make, you know, basically do something similar to what we're doing today, uh, make sauces with chile. Um, but this is one of the ingredients that have really changed the world. I mean, it's impossible to think of Italian food without tomatoes. Um, but it's one of the ingredients that when Mexico was conquered in 1519, it's one of the ingredients that made all of these ingredients made their way to Europe. Um, but people didn't really eat it for, for many, many, many years. Um, they were just thought it was, you know, poisonous. Um, it, the Catholic Church was just like, oh, I don't know about this. It's in the nightshade family. Maybe it's dangerous. Um, so the earliest printed recipe that we see for tomato um, in Italy is from 1692, um, a recipe by a cookbook, the modern cook by um, a cookbook author named Antonio Latini. And it's basically, basically a pico de gallo. It's basically, it's, it's nothing like an Italian sauce. It's basically tomato, onion, it's basically, and it's called uh, tomato Spanish style. So not Mexican style, Spanish style. So at that point, it's like, who knows where things are from, but it's basically a pico de gallo. Um, so I'm going to add one tomato. It's, it's, these are, I use two plum tomatoes, which is basically one cup of tomatoes, or you could use one, one big tomato, but I have two plum tomatoes. Whoops. Got to add all of that in there. And now I'm going to add one cup of bell pepper. Um, and also half a diced jalapeno. So spicy, this is kind of a sweet pepper. All peppers are native to Mexico, um, sweet, uh, spicy, and th they come from, or in Spanish it's chile, which is the, the Nahual word was chili, C-H-I-L-L-I, -L -L which is basically chile, but they were called pepper because when Columbus landed in the Americas, 1492, he was actually looking for pepper, Indian, you know, from India, peppercorns. Um, and so they basically attributed anything that was kind of hot, sponge, pungent, a little bit spicy. They just called it a pepper, even though the two completely different, you know, families. Um, but pepper or chiles were used, you know, as a, as a seasoning. Um, and also it was used as sort of, I guess you could call it like chemical warfare um, during war. Chiles would be burnt. If you've ever sort of toasted a chile, it makes you cough and makes you cry um, to sort of smoke out their op opponents. Um, and sometimes even when children would do something that their mom or their dad wasn't too happy with, children would be sat in front of burning chiles just to reprimand them, which is, sounds horrible, but these were things that were done. So I'm going to add about a cup, which is a little, this was a, a very small uh, pepper. I'm going to add about a cup of that to the, to everything else. And then half a jalapeno, a fresh jalapeno, not a, a pickled jalapeno. So this is a fresh one, which is a spicy. This is again, this is sweet. So I'm adding that. 
Do you keep the seeds in your jalapeno? Or do you I did them? not keep the seeds. I was following the, the recipe, Kellen's Foundation, very dutifully. But no, I did not keep them. Um, but sometimes I do when I make my own tops. The, the, the seeds are what gives it, makes it really, really spicy. But I just kept it just, um, I, I seeded them. So just to keep it all, you know, not too spicy. And only half of it also because my husband just doesn't really like spicy food. So just to, just to make sure it's okay. Um, so that we have everything in it's already looking very beautiful and colorful. Uh, and now I'm going to add half a cup of red onion. So red onion is an old world. Um, so now we're, we're moving to the other side of the world, pretty much with the rest of these, you know, ingredients. Um, so all of this, native to the Americas. Um, but then we have things like red onion, we have cilantro, we have cumin, we have, um, what else do we have? Garlic and all of these ingredients that were introduced post conquest. There are some onions native to, um, the, the, uh, to Mexico. If you've ever seen, it's almost like really fat scallions. Those are native to Mexico, but these other onions are actually are not, they're old world. So I'm just gonna add this, used for seasoning, you know, forever. And actually one of the oldest recipes ever, it dates to a, a, a tablet in cuneiform from ancient Babylonia, dates to about 1500 BC. The oldest recipe recorded, it's a tiny little thing and it has onion garlic, which we're using garlic powder today, and cumin, right? So these are among the oldest foods used for, for cooking and seasoning. So I'll talk about cumin more in a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna add half, it's basically like half a red onion. And red onion is nice because it's a little bit sweeter than, um, than it's, it's, I like raw red onion as opposed to like raw, like, yellow onion, red onion is really, really nice. Um, and so that's that. And I will get to the cumin in just a little bit. And we're gonna have some cilantro. Some people hate cilantro. Some people think it's um, tastes like soap to them. To some people, I love the taste of it. I think it's really, really fresh. Um, but this is one of the oldest herbs that was were cultivated for cooking, um, which is which is really, really interesting. It's actually native to the Eastern Mediterranean. It's not native to the Americas. Um, and again, it was one of the earliest plants that was used as a flavoring agent. And it's actually as old as wheat, as lentils. I mean, it's been used for millennia in the Eastern you know, Mediterranean. The Greeks and Romans used it. Um, they used it you know, medicinally. Um, and you see it a lot also like in, in Indian cuisine and in South Asian cuisine. Um, it's one of the ingredients that was introduced into Mexico in the 16th century and really just embraced. Um, we see it a lot in Mexican uh, cooking. So I'm gonna add about two tablespoons of cilantro. I'm just gonna chop this up. I didn't want to chop this one before because I didn't want it to get really brown. So I'm just going to coarsely chop two tablespoons ish of cilantro and add it to my salad. And I love it. It's so fresh. Two tablespoons of cilantro. And some lime juice. So I have about a quarter cup of squeezed lime that I'm gonna add in here. And lime, um, all citrus is, also, is actually native to Asia. Um, so it didn't make its way into Europe until the fourth century BC. Um, Alexander the Great's commanders, when they had made their way to, um, to India, they brought it back and started planting it. Um, in the Mediterranean, but it actually, and the Romans, the ancient Romans were the first to use it in cooking. So we actually see, you know, recipes, the earliest Western recipe 
dates to around 400 attributed to a man named Dupicius, and we see people cooking with, with lemon. Um, so we start seeing it used as a flavoring agent, also used in perfumery. With the fall of Rome, the Arabs spread it you know, from Persia to Sicily, to North Africa, to Spain, and then of course from Spain, it made its way to the Americas post-conquest. Um, so this is when we, we introduced it the, and within something like 20 years, it was growing you know, abundantly. And it's one of those ingredients, it's hard to imagine Mexican food without lime juice, um, but also native to Asia, another layer in the, in the story. So now that that is in there, I'm just gonna mix it to see all of these gorgeous colors. And then we're gonna add just the rest of the, of the seasonings. Um, I'm gonna add some garlic powder. It is one teaspoon of garlic powder, again, with um, cumin and onion in the world's oldest recipe. Adding an eighth of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper, which gives it another little, another little kick. Half a teaspoon of salt. And this is definitely something that grows, or not grows, but can be cultivated really in Mexico, basically anywhere. Um, and then we're using cumin. So one teaspoon of cumin. We see a lot of, you know, like I mentioned, it's in the oldest, oldest recipe. One of the first, you know, oldest foods or, or not foods, but um, plants that were cultivated for seasoning. So this is the powdered and this is the, the whole um, cumin. Um, and so there, the ancient Greeks and Romans used to use it to cure hysteria. Um, so it was used, you know, medicinally. Um, and the ancient Egyptians used to use cumin in their um, mummification, you know, practices in, in, in embalming. Um, made its way into the Americas post-conquest. And you see it in Southern Mexico, like they use a little bit in, in mole or they, in the Yucatan, they use it in, in a, a seasoning paste called a chiote, they use it a little bit, but you don't really get that taste of cumin. In, in moles and in, and, in, and in the chiote paste, it's kind of similar to the way that it's used in, in India where you eat Indian food and there's so many different spices that you don't really make out one spice over another because it's a balance. But you see a lot of cumin, like heavy cumin flavor in Northern Mexico and in like Tex-Mex cuisine or Cal-Mex cuisine. And this is because post, you know, conquest actually in the 17th, in the 1700s, early 1800s, when Northern Mexico was really started to be inhabited, you know, more so wheat was growing up, which is why we see the flour tortillas as opposed to corn. Um, but a lot of the people that were moving to the north were North Africans, were, were Berbers from North Africa that had been, you know, had made their way to Mexico. And they were used to cumin in their food. So they brought cumin up north. And this is why we see it a lot in Northern Mexico and a lot of Tex-Mex cuisine the rice has cumin, like everything is so cumin-y and a lot of, you know, Mexican food in the States as well. Um, it's basically because of, because of this. So I, I remember growing up, my mother's from Mexico City, my dad from the Yucatan, and then we would go to a restaurant, I grew up in Texas, we'd go to a restaurant and they would get a whiff of cumin and they were like, oh, this is not authentic. This is not real Mexican food. I was like, well, what does that mean, authentic? Everything, I mean, you could say this is, 100% authentic because it has everything or you could say you know the opposite it's like it just depends on how you look at it so I'm going to add a teaspoon of cumin to my salad and mix it up and look at this gorgeous how beautiful is this let me just mix it really well and this is an explosion of beauty what a perfect summer. I mean, this is a salad. You could use it with chips, you know, add, I don't know, maybe add a little avocado, just scoop it up with chips or just use it as a salad. I mean, I might do that right now. Just I want to taste it. Um, but I love this idea of deconstructing, taking a dish apart 
and the stories that it tells, um, the trade routes that you could follow, the histories that you get to, I mean, who knew, right? Cilantro had, was, was, you know, and cumin was among the earliest recipes. I need to buy some chips. Hmm. You make your own tortillas too. So you could, you could have that with tortillas. Exactly. I have some corn and I'm going to toast them. Mm. So okay. delicious. That's our salad. Beautiful. These movements with beans, with corn, even with wheat that was introduced post-conquest. There are huge movements in Mexico just to, to bring these original sort of the heirloom varieties and even the wheat that was introduced in Sonora, Mexico in the north. There was these whole movements to bring these original plants that were first you know, grains that were first planted just to sort of bring them back. So this, this, I, I just this, this consciousness of, you know, the land and what it gives us and what it says about us and just like the little grain of wheat or a little grain of rice and how that was brought over, right? Like the stories that are told. Um, so yeah, they teach us, yeah. So much art and food teaches so much art, art and food. Absolutely. The perfect combination. Um, and with that, we should make our own art. And I think um, the influence that it has on our, our own selves um, today, we're going to be doing a little bit of a uh, collage, um, which we will be including some of the supplies in our kits. Um, and really just with simple supplies, um, we just need paper, uh, like a small piece of white paper, um, if we want to start with five by seven or eight by 10, um, some, a variety of tissue paper colors. I have kind of the rainbow here, depending on what your color preferences are. I see Maite, you have, um, some beautiful, um, uh, tools for mark making there. So some, some, uh, markers and pens, um, are perfect. Um, and then we're going to need some sort of white glue and or um, a glue stick to adhere uh, various collage materials to our drawings today um, that are going to be inspired by Tatiana Percero's work um, and and a way to, uh, you know, kind of adhere the glue to the paper. So I have a, a you know, a little brush here or if you're using a glue stick, you won't need that. Um, and I think that's everything that we have um, that we'll need. So I want to, going back to like the idea of um, making with our hands and kind of like the ultimate way that we farm and create, um, I, I thought it would be nice for us to kind of focus on the hand as Tatiana did in her work um, and start with kind of drawing our hands out on the paper that we have in front of us. So the first thing I think we should do is um, take your hand in any kind of way that you can fit it on your paper. If you want to use a smaller piece of paper or a larger um, outline and trace the, um, the exterior of your hand. Should I do, um, can I do Sharpie or, or do I need to? Yeah, do if you want to do it in pencil or Sharpie, whatever you're most comfortable with. Because I, I lost, I just lost my pencil. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so I just did like a general outline of my hand. Um, I see you're doing that there. And then I'm going to add some um, details into my hand, kind of where my fingers are separated, um, where my nail beds are and where they come together. It does not have to be exact. Um, Tatiana does use images of her own body. Um, and then she superimposes um, either found imagery or imagery from historical texts that she references in her work. I'm going to put my birth. Ah, that's perfect. Yeah, so I just added some details of my nails and in between my hands. Um, if you wear a ring, you could draw that around your hand or a bracelet. If you have tattoos or not, or if you want tattoos, you could draw them on your hand. 
Um, and then, you know, I think what's nice about the idea of um, this universal idea of the human experience that Tatiana is referring to both like the, the personal and also kind of the universal, um, it's great to start adding kind of maybe some things that are important to you. It, um, she traces lineage to her historical roots in Mexico City. Um, and Maite, you can do the same, you know, and so kind of the, the paths that lead you to different places or that have led you from different places, uh, maybe it's a place that you feel comfortable, a home or a school or um, a center in your community that's been important to you throughout your life. You could draw things like that. Um, I drew a picture of my family on here um, and our dog. It could be things that you like to do that make you who you are, that make you an, an individual, or things that you don't like, perhaps. Um, and similar to what Tatiana does, um, we, we'll start with the black and white imagery, and then we'll start to layer some color on similar to our ingredients in this recipe and how layered ingredients make for a fuller recipe or picture. But, you know, you can make it as detailed as you want. It doesn't have to be perfect. It can be abstract too. Like if there are things or elements that you want to just use simple shapes and lines, I, I think Maite, you're doing a great job of including kind of some, some shapes that are universal. I have, uh, my house has round windows. Oh, I love that. So this is so relaxing. I have my family so far. I have and my dog, little house. That's Marcia. beautiful. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's and then when you're ready, um, you can either cut or tear tissue paper, which I think is great. Um, so easy to work with. It doesn't have to be exact. Tearing is fun, I think, and relaxing. Um, you can start adding some color into your work. And similar to um, our recipe, you can combine your colors to make new colors and, and to create kind of a layered approach to your tissue paper. Mm -hmm. Definitely it's one thing that whenever I'm doing something like this, don't overthink. Yes. That is that is key, I think, to just keep going and keep layering and enjoy the process. Don't worry about the product. Yours came out great. Thank you. How fun. <laughs> There's so lots of layers. Lots of layers, lots of history. Layers, lots of stories, yeah. That's great. And then you can frame that. You should give that to your, to your parents. I know. My mom would be like, what? She's, she's coming next week. So she'll think it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll frame it to show her, to, you know, <laughs> by her bed in my house. Oops. That's great. Well, thank you for showing us your process as we're creating. Thank you so much. Thank you. This is so fun. It was thank you, fun. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you have a wonderful day. You too. Have a great weekend. Thanks. I'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.